You are listening to a special edition of Outside the Boards podcast celebrating Oak Brook Polo Club's 100th anniversary. I'm Danny O'Leary. Founded in 1922 by legendary businessman Paul Butler, the Oak Brook Polo Club is an American polo treasure and one of the oldest polo clubs in the United States. It was once the sports epicenter for elite professional polo and served as home to the U.S. Open Polo Championships for 24 straight seasons and other prestigious international and national polo tournaments. Paul's primary and enduring passion was horsemanship. In 1921, Paul and his father, Frank Osgood Butler, planted the first polo field and brought polo to Oak Brook. It was in 1927, standing on the international field at Meadowbrook Polo before the start of the Westchester Cup, Paul prophesied, someday all this will be gone and the center of polo will be Oak Brook. Paul's prophecy came true in 1953 after the Open Championship was played in Meadowbrook. The next year, the Open moved to Oak Brook where it would be played until 1979, the longest consecutive time the Open has been played at one location. By 1956, Oak Brook Polo Club had 13 polo fields and stabling for 400 horses, with games played six days a week. The club also included grandstands, bleachers, and box seats, a clubhouse, and 36 miles of tree-lined trails. Paul joined four polo fields so they could be used as east-west and north-south airstrips for family and incoming guests. Those guests included royalty, dignitaries, and celebrities from His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, to Hollywood's Audrey Hepburn and Vivian Lee, and countless others visited the club. Paul also initiated and hosted a long list of international polo matches that drew legendary players from around the world. The Oak Brook team also traveled far and wide to support other clubs, and Oak Brook hosted international teams representing nearly 30 countries. Polo provided the village of Oak Brook a lifestyle appeal, a social sporting scene amplified and carried on by his son Michael and daughter Jory. It helped lay claim that polo created Oak Brook. The Oak Brook Polo Club was the largest polo plant in the world from 1954 to 1979 and would be billed the polo capital of the United States or Polo Town. In 2022, the Oak Brook Polo Club will be celebrating its 100th anniversary, but returning to its original and masterpiece field, the Cecil Smith Field. To honor this historic occasion, the Oak Brook Polo Club has invited club friends and family to share stories of their fondest memories of visiting and playing at Oak Brook. Join us as we take listeners down memory lane with some of the sport's household names while they share their experiences at Oak Brook and the impact the club and its founders have played on their lives. Saddle up. Welcome to this Outside the Board special podcast edition with me, Danny O'Leary. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our third episode of the special edition podcast of Outside the Board celebrating Oak Brook Pole Club's 100th anniversary. Before I introduce my next guest, did you know that Oak Brook was also home to United States Polo Association's headquarters from 1954 to 1986? Combine this with the U.S. Open Polo Championship 24-year reign and other prestigious tournaments, as well as the numerous legendary players who got their start or played in Oak Brook, the village of Oak Brook sure is a great candidate to host a satellite museum celebrating the sport. My guest on today's podcast is Dr. Richard Khalil, who you all might know as the Federation of International Polo's former president. But did you know his first experience with polo began at the Oak Brook Polo Club? That's right. Dr. Khalil got involved in the sport of polo in his mid-30s after a friendly dare while attending a polo match at Oak Brook. Little did he know at the time that dare would be life-altering. The fast-paced sport appealed to the young doctor and will play a major role in his life that began in Oak Brook and ended in Santa Barbara, where he has retired. Dr. Khalil is a dear friend to the Butler family and has numerous stories of his time as a player and spectator at Oak Brook. We are honored to have him on this special podcast. Enjoy. Dr. Richard Khalil, great to have you and speak to you again. Hello, Daniel. It's good to talk to you and uh, have this opportunity to do a little uh, reminiscing about the Oak Brook Polo Club. Absolutely. Absolutely. Many terrific memories for me. We're pretty excited, you know, going into our 100th anniversary, beginning January 1. And I don't know if you've heard, but we're moving back to Cecil Smithfield, yeah. which is pretty historic. But it's exciting to talk to you because even our last podcast that we have with Outside the Boards, you know, you shared some great stories, your relationship with Oak Brook. So I'm really excited to kind of go into the depths of your place in Oak Brook's history. So, but before we get started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Dr. Richard Khalil? For those in the audience that don't know who you are. Okay. 
Well, of course, my profession was professor of surgery, and I practiced in Chicago for many years. And as far as my polo background, I played polo for about 40 years, and then I'm still involved with polo to this day with the Federation of International Polo and the USPA. I've played in about 23 countries and have had wonderful experiences in polo around the world. So I think that's my background. You're a household name. <laughs> you are. 23 countries. Yeah. I mean, majority of the people in, who are listening to this are avid individuals within the polo communities. So no question about it. But what is your affiliation with Oak Brook? Well, I became a member of the Oak Brook Polo Club back in the 70s in Chicago and was actively playing there for at least 20 or 25 years before I moved to California and played more in California and other parts of the world. So I have a long history with Oak Brook and especially back in some of the glory days, in my opinion. I have a lot of wonderful memories about those days and, of course, many friendships that have endured to this day. Now, if I recall correctly, you got your first polo experience at Oak Brook and that kind of carried you into the sport, did it not? Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, what happened was uh, there is a family, the Crammel family, that played polo at Oak Brook and two sons and their father played as a team. And I happened to meet them, and they invited me to a polo match at Oak Brook. So I went to the polo match, and I watched it. And I said, wow, that really looks exciting and like a lot of fun. And one of the brothers, I think it was Ken, said, you could never learn. <laughs> well, <laughs> that was the gauntlet. And several broken bones later and a lot of sweat and tears working at, with the Coons at their farm, at Fairlane Farms outside of Chicago. That was my introduction to polo. And then it, it was history from there. So what was that gentleman's name that, that put a bet on you? Ken Crammel, I think. So was there, was there any money down on that or no? There was no money on that bet? No money on that. Just ego and pride, <laughs> that's all. Well, the, the great thing about that story is that after speaking with Joel Baker, it always sounds as though during that time period that so many individuals that are just, you know, household names in polo had come through or have gotten their start at Oak Brook, including yourself. That's definitely true. How long did you play at Oak Brook before you went to Santa Barbara, right? Yes, that's correct. I played there for about at least 25 years, maybe more. I have to really figure it out, but at least that and played with my two sons there. Is there a time period or an event that really sticks out? in your mind that you would want to share with us? Well, there's several, of course. I remember the first Gould Cup that was played there. That was a $100,000 prize, I believe. And I think that was the biggest prize to that date in polo. And unfortunately, it rained. And that was the first time I saw them bring in helicopters to try and dry the field. <laughs> so the helicopters did their best to dry the field, and they actually had the game. And it was exciting and very crowded. And of course, that was when Bill Ilvesacker was the head of Gould and was the sponsor of the tournament. And actually, to carry that a step further, that was in the days when Bill Ilvesacker had the idea to build the International Polo Club in Wellington, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I remember going down there with him to look at the area, and it was nothing but swamp. <laughs> And it just seemed like the most impossible idea in the world. And of course, now today, it's one of the biggest centers of polo in the world. What year was that, do you recall, with the helicopters drying the field? Uh, it was in the 70s is the best I can do on that, but I, I don't remember the exact year. Was it like uh, military-grade helicopters or was it a bunch of Sikorskis? Well, they were big helicopters. They were. I don't remember that much detail about them, but I can certainly tell you that it was something to be sitting in the stands and having the helicopters come way down low over the field. You could see the wind blowing and everything happening to dry the field. <laughs> I've only had one other experience of trying to dry a polo field so you could play polo, and that was in northern India. And we were there for a FIP Ambassador Cup, and it rained. And they had 
at least 200 people on the field with buckets and towels drying the oh fields. Oh, my gosh. They will do anything to get a game in. I swear <laughs> I heard a similar story in, for Greenwich where they used helicopters to dry their field at one uh -huh. time. Seems to be more of a common practice than we think. Yeah, absolutely. Was Butler Aviation around at that time still? No, I think they were already out of Butler Aviation by that okay. time. Yes, I think I think so. Got it. And then, of course, another great event in the 80s, in 86, was, of course, when Prince Charles came and played at Oak Brook. And that was a huge affair. And we had a fabulous time. He came with Andrew Hine and Major Ronald Ferguson, who, of course, is Fergie's father. And I don't remember the fourth player's name, but that was a huge event. And those were the days when we were had a lot of international polo at Oak Brook. Michael Butler was instrumental in developing international polo. We would exchange teams with other countries. Uh, I played in Jamaica and Mexico and Italy and a couple of other places with teams from Oak Brook. And then, of course, we hosted teams at Oak Brook in return. And a lot of the people are well known. Bobby Putz played on many of those teams with me. He played in Mexico and Jamaica with me. And of course, Bob was CEO of the USBA. So his history with polo is very significant. I will be talking with him next week, Tuesday. So he'll be joining me. I'm excited to hear his background with Oak Brook Polo as well. Great. Well, give him my regards and tell him I remember those games. <laughs> Now, some of the, the standout international matches at Oak Brook, as I look, you know, past schedules has always been with Mexico. Mexico was a regular. Yes. Ireland, the Irish Cup, seemed to be a, a regular. Yes. The Japur Cup, which I know obviously is India. Yes. And then usually I think there's always an English or European. I think that was British coming over to play. The British came and also the Italians. They did, okay. We had a very close relationship with the Italians. We played there a couple of times and they played here a couple of times. The main gentleman from Italy was Dante Fava and he was an incredible host and we had wonderful games in Rome and at Argentario, mm -hmm. that was the club. I also played with a different team in Milan. They, they actually televised that game in Italy in Milan and I played with my two sons, and they kept calling me Papa Khalil. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Oh, that name had to have stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know about that Italian relationship. You know, what's on in my office right now, I'm staring at it right now, is a trophy that I found from some estate sale on eBay. Mm -hmm. And it was the Gucci Cup. And I don't know if that has any relevancy from when Italy came here to play. No, I don't think it did. I think that must be a different cup. Gucci may have been a sponsor at one time of Oak Brook Polo Club, but yeah, this it's it's a, it's a beautiful little cup. I don't think it's the main trophy. I think this is what they gave to the first place winners, but it's really interesting. You'd be surprised, and like now and then, I'll go on to eBay or even Etsy and Google an Oak Brook Polo Club, and something will likely pop up. For example, I have an ashtray on my little podcast desk here with the old Oak Brook Polo Club emblem in it. So you obviously got a very special award from Prince Charles himself is that 1986 match when they came over. How did that event even kind of came about? Was it, was it part of a tour that Prince Charles was doing at that time? Or was this uh, intentional for him to come over and play in Oak Brook? No, I think it was intentional for him to come over and play at Oak Brook. It was a terrific event. And I have to say that he was a very nice gentleman. I mean, he was just another player with the teams, but I have to admit that I admired how he could change his approach when he went into uh, the public sphere of the parties and things like that. But when we were all together getting into our gear and things like that, he was just another guy. It was terrific. <laughs> he was just one of the boys at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the great thing about these people. There might be in the spotlight, so much attention is brought to them and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, they're human beings and they probably just want to crack open a beer and sit field side with you for the most part. So I'm actually hoping to get Prince Charles on this podcast if I can, given his deep relationship with the Butler family 
as I know that they were regulars over even in Europe. That's for sure. Yes, that's true. So did you get a chance to actually play alongside or against him? Well, no, I didn't get to play alongside him, but I did get to take care of him when he had an unfortunate dismount. <laughs> he actually had a physician, British naval officer physician, traveling with him. And I can't remember the officer's name, but he and I uh, took care of the prince. Unfortunately, he wasn't injured and he remounted and continued and finished the game. Mm-hmm. But that was pretty exciting when he came off and everybody... <laughs> Thought, oh my goodness, not at Oak Brook, please. <laughs> wasn't it just a, a fall off the horse? He wasn't hit in any sort of no, way, he was it? Was, yes, just lost his yes, balance was, kind of thing? I don't remember if he was bumped or whatever, but he was unhorsed. And, well, he wasn't injured. He was fine. <laughs> so that worked out. That's great. So technically, you were Oak Brook's team physician in, in a way. In a way, yes. <laughs> yes. Were there any other times at all where you had to kind of run out to the field to check on someone? I've had... Many, many experiences throughout my entire career of attending to someone on the polo field. Uh, (laughs) Most of the time, fortunately, they were not terrible, but I have had some other times that were more difficult. There was one group of teams that used to come to Oak Brook that we didn't mention before, and those were the celebrity teams. Three or four celebrities would come to Oak Brook, and we would share teams, two celebrities and two Oak Brook players on a team, and we would have a celebrity polo match. And those were extremely popular as well. We had Stephanie Powers, and we had very prominent Hollywood celebrities would come and play. And those were big events. Bill Devane came and played. Of course, Michael Butler's parties were legendary in Chicago. (laughs) There might be 2,000 people at the game, and there'd be 4,000 people at the party. (laughs) (laughs) I've seen pictures, and I swear to God, I saw a picture of Tommy Lee Jones out here. I don't know if he's one of the celebrities at all at one point during his younger days. And Don, his wife. And then, I don't know, was Sylvester Stallone ever out here? Not that I'm aware of, no, but he did play here at Santa Barbara Polo Club. Mm -hmm. He doesn't still play, does he? No, I think that the studio made him quit if I heard the story properly, but that's only hearsay. Uh I heard that was when he was really making all of those movies and they were afraid if he got injured, it would interfere with the uh, filming. I can appreciate the studio's decision on that one. That's for sure. Makes sense. Now, you got a pretty big award given to you by Prince Charles. Yes, that was quite exciting. There was a big dinner party after the matches and... They had a ballot for the most improved player of the year. And to my surprise, when it was announced, I won it. So the prince awarded me the trophy, which I'm sitting here looking at, as a matter of fact. (laughs) I have a whole wall here of trophies, and many, many of them are very important reminders of Oak Brook. Is there one outside of that that really stands out? Oh, my goodness. That's a tough question. (laughs) There's some unusual ones. We won a beautiful trophy at Elephant Polo in Nepal. That was something different for sure. Mm -hmm. Representing Oak Brook? No, that wasn't representing Oak Brook. That was from California. Okay. Did you travel at all with Michael or a team representing Oak Brook or Oak Brook as the USA team overseas? Yes. Yes, I did. I did that in Jamaica and Mexico and Italy and Singapore and Brunei. And I believe there's some others, but I don't remember them now. But those I remember specifically. Who were some of your teammates? Well, let's see. I'm looking at the photographs here. So in Jamaica was Bob Putz, Adam Butler, Mark Adrian, and myself. In Mexico, these are just individual games. We played in all those places a number of times. Mm -hmm. These are the pictures I'm looking at. In Mexico was Bob Putz, Adam Butler, Michael Butler, and me. And the photo from Italy was Scott Devon, Michael Butler, Adam Butler, and Steve Yackley. And in Singapore and Brunei was me and my son Thomas. And Mark Adrian and Paul Adrian. Yeah, that was those teams. You know, those were great adventures. 
I'll say. I feel like the government probably should have hired Oprah Polo Club to, to kind of take care of all this diplomacies <laughs> with some of these other countries. No question about it. Now, did you play with your sons at Oprah quite often? Yes, we did. The one thing that was unique at Oak Brook was the number of family teams that were there at the time with at least two or more family members on a team. Mm -hmm. And that created a terrific environment. It, it was really amazing. There was the Butlers, my family, the Kuhn family, the Wigdahl family, Adrian family, the Devon family, Stoddard family, Crammel family. Yackley family, Rackley <laughs> family, Wolva soccer family. All of those families had at least two members of the family on the team, and a number of them had three. There weren't any fours that I can recall, but there were threes. It was a wonderful competitive spirit, and it was a lot of fun. The Oak Brook Polo Club is thrilled to announce the creation of the Friends of Oak Brook Polo. The club's not-for-profit arm created with the mission of supporting quality recreational and competitive polo in Oak Brook through the rejuvenation and sustainability of polo activities. This will ensure the long-term health of the polo club so that it continues to thrive and host safe and competitive polo for future generations. The goal of the organization will be to raise and invest funds for maintaining and improving Oak Brook Polo Club's fields so that it remains a healthy, safe, and competitive venue for the sport of polo and for the development of recreational polo programs to help advance the sport in the area. To learn more or to donate, please visit www.oakbrookpoloclub.com for more information or contact us directly at info at oakbrookpoloclub.com. Thank you in advance for your support in helping to preserve the club's history and importance in the global polo community. Now, when I spoke to Joel, he was reminiscing about some of the teams from nearby states that would come in, mm -hmm. including going up to the Milwaukee Polo Club and playing against the U-Lines. Yes. And the Bush family was also a regular one. He actually told me a really funny story of, I think it was Anheuser Bush that took a photo of one of the U-Lines drinking a Budweiser beer and posting it like in Milwaukee as part of an advertising campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. <laughs> I heard that. I'm like, we need to find that picture because I'm from Wisconsin. I'm like, that is sacrilegious right there. You don't want to get caught with that. <laughs> yeah, they would come up in, to Oak Brook and play and we would go there and play. I played both of those places. And in those days, back in the 70s, Dick Bunn used to land his T6 trainer, Air Force trainer, on one of the polo fields to come and play polo. <laughs> and it was like a pseudo airport on that field. Wasn't it two polo fields end to end to each other? So they were able to do that? Or is it just one field? No, I think it was two polo fields. End -end. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, those days are gone. There were like, I think there were seven fields at that time, six or seven fields. So... At Oak Brook in the 70s? Yeah, I think there, there were that many fields, you know. That sounds about right. Until the next golf course was built. Yeah, well, we played a team from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. And that was quite interesting. Yeah, I think we did an article, I think it was back in 2018 or 2019, and I think we counted upwards to 30 countries that had come through at Oak Brook and one other. And one of the interesting one, and this was, I think, pre-World War II, was Cuba way before the embargo. Mm -hmm. And this was when polo was highly used in teaching military officers, developing their horsemanship skills. And Cuba came up here mm -hmm. to do that on Paul Butler's horses. Yeah. So I find that to be incredibly fascinating. All these relationships with other countries that existed at one point or another where it came through. That's for sure. It's interesting too that how involved the military is in polo in some of these countries. In India, I was at the, I think it's the 61st Cavalry. I think it's called 61st Cavalry, a regiment in Jaipur. Mm -hmm. They're very active in the polo community, and we played there. When I was in Iran, where I organized an international polo tournament about, probably about five or six years ago, they had just reopened polo at the Iranian army bases. And they bought horses and built fields at their major army bases in Tehran. And they mm -hmm. took me around to show them to me. That was when I was president of the International Federation. 
and we had an international tournament there, which was very interesting. <laughs> so it seemed comparable to, you know, when I had conversations with Joel Baker and, yeah, I'm not sure of Mike Daly, but I'm trying to remember the another individual that I've already spoken to. It seems like you obviously have a, a much longer history than them with Oprah. You're 20 some plus odd years while there were, you know, brief stints of maybe four to five years. Mm -hmm. How important is Oprah to you in your polo career or even in your social life? Well, Oprah is very important to me in both of those areas, first of all, because that was really when I was coming up in polo and was very active and had the pleasure of playing with my two sons and playing in all these family tournaments and traveling around the world. And socially, I have to say that I realize it's a little bit of a cliche, but Winston Churchill's quotation of a polo handicap as a passport to the world is actually, in my case, so true that it's almost unbelievable. Mm -hmm. The friendships that I built in Oak Brook, both with American players and international players that came through and the players and people that I've met throughout my career in international polo is just a critical part of my social life. All of these people from Oak Brook, most of whom I still have contact with, in fact, at Michael Butler's 90th birthday party, I would say that Almost everyone that I have named, plus others from around the world that played there that were involved, all showed up for the party. You know, mm -hmm. those friendships have lasted a lifetime. In terms of Oak Brook and its history with the sport, do you see as though Oak Brook continues to play a very, very important role in the greater polo community? Definitely. Oak Brook is a historic pillar of American polo. It supported polo. For so many years, and during the difficult years when polo was struggling to grow, I guess would be a way to put it. And they hosted the U.S. Open. They hosted uh, major tournaments. They developed major tournaments that helped to develop the sport and to help the sport to grow and not diminish. And all of these tournaments that they created are still played. The Butler Handicap, all of those tournaments still exist. Mm -hmm. You know, when it was impossible for the USBA to have the facilities like they do now, they would host the US Open and things of that type and provide the financial support that was necessary from private means. Yeah. In addition to the Butler Handicap, which was created here in Oak Brook alongside the U.S. Open to give those who were obviously kicked out of the tournament opportunity to continue to play. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Butler Challenge, the Butler International Cup. Ronnie Tong told me that Oak Brook played a vital role in having the Westchester come back again. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a very, very old trophy to be played with, but, you know, it's Oak Brook's role to bring that back. So it's quite incredible. I mean, Paul Butler is coined as a patron saint of polo because he gave the sport a home following World War II, if my facts are correct. That's exactly what I was trying to say, and you said it very well. And it's funny, like, you know, I'll even talk to people who are in mainstream sports here in Chicago, and they're so surprised that this history exists in such a very unique sport that they see as something that would be more popular down in Kentucky or in Florida, where they probably most commonly know. They don't know that, oh my God, Chicagoland has this history in polo. We never knew that we were such a staple in the greater global polo community. It's just like, yeah, it's, it exists. I mean, you look at even like the Hall of Fame, Chicagoland Hall of Fame, no one from polo is in it. No one. And it's like, all right, that's got to change <laughs> because there's such a huge presence. You can't always give it to a Bears player and all that. And I always thought that's another interesting factoid is I think we're the fourth oldest sports organization in Chicagoland. I think we were founded right after the Chicago Bears, who celebrated, I think, their 100th anniversary last year. And Oak Brook also has six national titles, U.S. Open titles to its name, which I think is like the third most of all the sports organizations in Chicago. So a lot to be said there. That's for sure. I agree. Any other stories you want to share with us 
Richard, we're trying to keep things PG-13 slightly. <laughs> so <laughs> I know Joel Baker would tell me, like, I guess he lived in the pool house with Stuart and I think Mike Daly. Yeah, I think he could have gone on and on and on. He shared a funny story of when it was the polo ball, it was at the Bath Tennis Club, and they actually took off with the trophies of Paul Butler, which were used as centerpieces. <laughs> I um, remember that. <laughs> and, and Jory freaking out in the morning when we giving Mike Butler a call and realized, oh, they're all in his trophy case. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember that. They took the trophies home. <laughs> quite a panic when that happened. I would say yeah, so. <laughs> well, the party scene was quite remarkable. And of course, Michael had incredible friends. You know, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones would show up and they'd have parties at the house. And there would be all sorts of celebrities. And Michael was friends with some of the most beautiful women that were around at the time. And there was a lot of social events and a lot of parties and a lot of good times. And the parties after the polo matches were, as I said, they were big events. People came out from Chicago for those. They didn't come for the game, but they came for the party afterward. You know, <laughs> they would go into the late hours of the night and they were quite something. Were these all on Sunday evenings, on yeah. work evenings? Yes. Yeah, I'm being pressured to somehow figure out a way to find a venue to bring back these parties. It's quite difficult since everything has changed around yes. there. But. Progress is being made, nonetheless. Also, real quick, your wife. Now, didn't you meet her here in, in Chicago as well at Oak Brook? Can we claim that you've met your wife at a polo match? No, can't <laughs> claim that one. <laughs> no, when I saw that polo match with the Crambles, we were married and we had a daughter. I can't <laughs> say I met her at Oak Brook. <laughs> <laughs> but polo has some importance to it regardless. Well, it sure does. She's an equestrian athlete too, is she yeah, not? Or yes, was? she is. She's uh, the best rider in the family. She's a silver medal international dressage winner. So that's fantastic. She's done very well at that. She hasn't done as well as Joel Baker's wife, who's an international champion as well. Uh, he failed to mention that. We were talking too much about his skiing career. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, his wife, Charlotte, is very big in the dressage world today. She's an official with the U.S. dressage team and very accomplished. My wife was also a very accomplished dressage rider. You know, one of the things I would love to bring back is the, I think it was the Oak Brook. I don't know if it was a hunter jumper competition that was here. I don't know if it was on any one of the fields. Do you recall that at all from your days playing here? They had uh, a couple of those events. Like an Oak Brook Grand Prix or yeah, something? they did. And in the days prior to my arriving there, you know, they used to have fox hunting and everything there, every equestrian sport you can think of. And then, of course, as Oak Brook developed around the club, then, of course, some of those things were not available. But every horse discipline was practiced at Oak Brook at one time or another. And there's not much room for that anymore. And I don't know if the forest preserve that's across the street from the Oak Brook Sports Corps was used for that. Ronnie Tong actually told the story of they used to go, there's like a softball field or something tucked away somewhere and they would all go to it and drink and they would get kicked off of it. <laughs> As I recall, there was only one place in Oak Brook at that time that was a bar, a public bar. I'm trying to remember. Was it the Saddle Club or was that it? No, there was another one that, that besides the Saddle Club. And I can't remember. It was just a little dingy little place on the side road, but I don't remember the detail. You know, there's a, oh my gosh, it's escaping me. There's a tavern there's something. Hinsdale is what I'm thinking of. Yeah. There's a little red house. It's escaping me right now. It's on York Road. It's tavern something, but it is in Hinsdale. Yeah, it's Hinsdale. And that was the only one that was grandfathered into Hinsdale. Otherwise, Hinsdale was dry at that time. <laughs> that's what it was. That doesn't seem the case like that anymore. Hinsdale is a beautiful town. But hey, Richard, thank you so much for joining me. This is great. And any final words for those who are listening? Well, just thank you for the opportunity to reminisce and participate. And I encourage everyone to go to Oak Brook and help them celebrate their 100th anniversary. I'm sure you'll have a good time and you'll see some good polo. Okay, can I count on you to be coming? I think we're going to be bringing back the polo ball. Well, I think that there's an excellent chance. I certainly want one. Now, there's one question I actually have. It just popped into my mind before we go. Okay. This whole bear nickname. Yes. 
I asked Joel Baker and he didn't seem to know how it even originated. Do you can shed any sort of light on this? What is your bear nickname? <laughs> well, my nickname is Nummy Bear. I don't know exactly how it all started, but of course, Michael is just called Bear and you were invited to join. And there are members, quite a few international members as well. And we keep in touch pretty much. And it's a nice connection. It seems like a very exclusive club because I'll get emails and it like it says it in their email name like you. <laughs> what am I missing here? So I look forward to meeting other members. That's for sure. Well, you will at the Polo Ball for the 100th anniversary, I'm sure. No doubt about it. Well, thank you, Richard, again. Thank you so much. I look forward to having you out here and enjoy this last month of uh, 2021. You too. We'll see you in the new year. Take care. The Oak Brook Polo Club is thrilled to announce the creation of the Friends of Oak Brook Polo. The club's non-for-profit arm created with the mission of supporting quality recreational and competitive polo in Oak Brook through the rejuvenation and sustainability of polo activities. This will ensure the long-term health of the polo club so that it continues to thrive and host safe and competitive polo for future generations. The goal of the organization will be to raise and invest funds for maintaining and improving Oak Brook Polo Club's fields so that it remains a healthy, safe, and competitive venue for the sport of polo and for the development of recreational polo programs to help advance the sport in the area. To learn more or to donate, please visit www.oakbrookpoloclub.com for more information or contact us directly at info at oakbrookpoloclub.com. Thank you in advance for your support and helping to preserve the club's history and importance in the global polo community. That was a great episode. We hope you had fun listening and learning about Oak Brook Polo Club's unique and storied history. If you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to listen to others as we continue to celebrate this historic season. Thanks for stopping by my friends and hope to see you at Oak Brook this summer.